We're going to be looking through verse 14. As I mentioned just a moment ago in my remarks regarding the Apostles' Creed, we are coming to some very hard words from Jesus as we conclude this Sermon on the Mount. I would say that especially what we're going to be looking at next Sunday are some of the most frightening words that Jesus ever uttered. So the Word is going to confront us with a very hard but very necessary truth this morning. And the truth is that Christianity is at the same time the easiest and the hardest thing that you will ever experience. Salvation is the freest gift you will ever receive. And nevertheless, it's the hardest life that you'll ever live. It's so simple, and at the same time, it's so difficult. It's absolutely free, and yet it costs everything. And I know that that may be difficult to wrap our minds around, but as we look at the Gospels, and especially these final verses of the Sermon on the Mount, I mentioned this last Wednesday evening, it seems that Jesus does everything that he possibly can to talk people out of following him. Contrary to many modern evangelistic strategies that water down the truth to the point that it's not really even the Gospel anymore. So the next three weeks we're going to be confronted with, as I said, some of the hardest words in all of Scripture. Many years ago, Adelai Stevenson encouraged a young man who was wanting to go into politics, wanting to be successful. And he told him that the key to political success in the United States was this. It's very interesting. He says, you either have to have a vague faith, strongly held, or you have to have a strong faith, vaguely held. Somewhere some vagueness has to be there. But friends, the truth of Scripture is, a vague and shallow faith is really no faith at all. And my greatest fear in American evangelicalism is that people have affirmed a kind of cultural Christianity that knows nothing of the Christ of Scripture and knows nothing of the genuine gospel. It's, it's a user-friendly, sugar-coated kind of gospel. And dear friends... It is because I love you that I must tell you that a commitment to the hollow, vain God of American civic religion will not save you. And it is ultimately idolatry. Friends, the fact that our money has the word God on it does not insulate one person from the fires of hell. In God we trust is only meaningful if the God in whom you trust is the true and living God of Scripture. You see what I mean by the vague faith? If, if our proclamation is, I believe in God... What God? God! It's in God I trust. James says, you believe in God? Good. The demons do as well and they shudder. I know this is difficult, but it's important because this is what Jesus comes to as we arrive in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Follow along as I read verses 12 through 14. Jesus says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. 
Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So just in these three short verses, we, they serve to move us from the body of the sermon to the conclusion of the sermon. I titled this series many, many weeks ago when we started the greatest sermon effort, and I still stand by that opinion that this is truly the greatest sermon ever. It is the greatest sermon in its content. It is the greatest sermon in its theme. It is the greatest sermon in its structure. It is the perfect sermon. And as any good sermon ought to have, it's got to come to an end at some point, right? And sometimes we like to close many times over and over and over again. You've heard preachers who do that, right? They say in closing about eight times before they finish. Jesus doesn't do that. His is the perfect sermon. In verse 12, as we're going to see, is the transition to the final application part of the sermon. It's what a good sermon does. A good sermon explains the text, expounds the text, exposits the text. Exposit means draw out the meaning of the text. Okay? Exegesis means get at the meaning of the text. Eisegesis means read your own meaning into the text. Exegesis means let the text speak for itself. So what has Jesus been doing? He's been expounding the nature of the Old Testament law. You've heard it said, do not commit murder. But I say unto you, if you've even been angry at your brother in your heart, you've already committed murder in your heart. And he's done the same thing in regard to lust and in regard to how we treat our enemies. And he's done the same thing in regard to worry and judging and all the different things that we've been looking at. But now in these verses, he makes a transition not only to the content of what the law is, but how that applies to what we're going to do. The hearing of the gospel is a moral act. Some of you may have come here to this service this morning thinking that you were just going to be a spectator. You know you have as much responsibility in this moment as I do. The hearing of the word of God is a moral act. You're presented with truth and then you're called upon to apply that, or I should say, to allow the Holy Spirit to apply that to your life in action, in behavior, in fruit that God's bring, God brings forth. And really, as we look at this conclusion, the point is very clear. Our purpose is very clear. And I hope that you're going to hear, I hope that you're going to see that the way of Christ is gloriously hard. Well, preacher, that, that's not the way to draw crowds, to tell somebody it's going to be hard. But as a herald of the Word of God, I'm called to tell you what God has said. Not to make up my own dressed up, sugar-coated message. Jesus says it's going to be gloriously hard. And I know we don't like hard things. Make no mistake. We like easy things. You just think about the technology and the advances and all the things that have happened over the last couple of decades. Everything is in effort to make life easier. And in the process, what have we done? So often we've made life more difficult. And so often that's the problem. We don't like hard things. And then you may be thinking at this point, Preacher, you always tell us salvation is free. Well, well, free ain't hard. Right? If it's free, how can it also be hard? 
Well, this is what Jesus gets at in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at. So let me just mention a couple of things as we look. Verse 12, and then I want to take verses 13 and 14 together. And here's the point. As we think about the title of the message, the simple difficulty of salvation. Well, let's, let's deal with the simple part first. Salvation is as simple as following the golden rule. I mean, weren't you raised with the golden rule? Maybe your mother, your father, your grandparents taught you the golden rule. They may not have called it the golden rule. But it's one of the most timeless moral truths of all creation. Do to other people what you want them to do to you. So salvation is as simple as following the golden rule. Verse 12 is another one of these famous verses that people love to quote from the Sermon on the Mount. And truly, it is a wonderful truth to live by. As I've already said, we know it most commonly as the golden rule. Treat others as you would want to be treated. Or put another way, don't do something to someone else that you wouldn't want them to do to you. One of the earliest lessons we teach our children. But Jesus is not providing a simple proverb. What I mean by that is, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, you've got these sections, right? To the end of chapter 5, you've got all of these categories, anger and lust and oaths and retaliation. And then in chapter 6, he, as we've talked about, he talks about motivation. What's your motivation for giving? What's your motivation for prayer? What's your motivation for fasting? Is it for the approval of men or is it for the approval of God? He says it not only relates to religious things, it relates to how you interact with other people. Do you worry? Do you judge? And then it almost appears when we get to this passage in chapter 7 verse 12, after we've talked about prayer last time, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened to you. Just almost out of nowhere, this proverb, the golden rule. It's almost as if Jesus is preaching along and then he says, oh, and another thing, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Now, that's something that a, a scatterbrained preacher like myself might do, forget what I was going to say and come back later and say, oh, and by the way, but that's not the way it happens in the perfect Word of God. There's more to this than just a proverb. The verse begins with the Greek word, un. It's, it's, it's a, like a conjunction word. The ESV translates it so. If you've got the King James Version, it translates it therefore. Depending on what, you, what translation you're looking at, it'll be so or therefore. Uh, it means consequently or accordingly or therefore. So this is not just a random proverb. This is an application of what Jesus has said before. So he says, ask, seek, knock, don't judge by any standard that you're not willing to be judged by. Take the log out before you point out the speck in your brother's eye. Stop worrying. God is sovereign. He will care for you. Give and pray and fast with proper motivation. Understand the nature of the law and how miserably you fail at it. All of these lessons that he's been saying. And then he says, therefore, and he gives this summary statement. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. You see what he's done there? He just masterfully gave a little sentence that summarizes all of the chapters that we've been looking at for weeks. All of the rambling that I've been doing for going on months now, he says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. 
Now, how do I know that's his summary statement? Because he says, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, don't miss that part, okay? So it's, it's not just a summary statement about prayer that we looked at last week. It's about judging and worrying and treasuring and fasting and praying and giving and loving enemies and not taking revenge and taking oaths properly and, and how we ought to think about divorce and lust and anger. For this is the law and the prophets, verse 12. Now, how do I know that's a summary statement? Turn back to chapter 5, verse 17. Look at chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Okay, so he's given the Beatitudes. Then he talks about being salt and light. So I've said the Beatitudes are like a blueprint of the gospel, the blueprint of salvation. Where does salvation start? Poor in spirit. Spiritual bankruptcy. I have nothing to bring to the table. I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a Savior. Then he says you're to be salt and light. Now look at verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. There's that phrase. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And then he goes on to say, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then the key verse is 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he proceeds for the next half chapter, whole, all of chapter 6, and up to this point in chapter 7, to tell Tell us, here is the nature of God revealed in the Old Testament law. This is the body of his sermon from chapter 5 verse 17 to chapter 7 verse 12 is the body of Jesus' sermon. And he wraps it all up by saying, here's the nutshell version of what I've said. And not only what I've said, but what the whole Old Testament says. Treat others as you would be treated. And we say, how easy is that? And we think to ourselves, the golden rule. That's the law in the prophets. When Jesus is asked later by the lawyer, what is the greatest commandment? He says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So I say again, salvation is as simple as following the golden rule. Treat others well. Love them. Care for them. That is the character of God that's revealed in the law. We've been going through Exodus chapter 21 and chapter 22 and 23 and we're seeing all of these very specific laws that God gives to his people Israel revealing the kind of God he is. So salvation, I'll say it again, is as simple as following the golden rule. And you think, whew, that is so simple, that is so easy, I feel so much better. Well, it's my job to step on your toes. Because here's the problem. The problem is, once again, as we saw in all of chapter 5, you can't and you won't. You are completely and utterly unable to follow the golden rule in and of yourself. Oh, we teach our children that. And we have full expectation that they will treat others as they would be treated. But can you be honest with yourself for a moment? How many of you in this room have followed that rule perfectly your entire life? None of us have. So salvation is as simple as following the golden rule, but it's as difficult as the fact that none of us can do it. And so we scratch our head and it seems so unfair. 
God gives us a requirement that seems on the surface so easy. And yet, it is impossible. In commenting on this golden rule, great Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, speaking of man, he is a creature that is so bound and governed by evil that he cannot keep the golden rule. The gospel always starts with that. The first principle in theology is the fall of man and the sin of man. You realize in your own human fallen sin nature you cannot adequately follow the golden rule as simple as it sounds. You see, salvation is as simple as loving God and loving others. So just do it, friends. Just do it. The problem is you can't. And I can't. And Lloyd-Jones couldn't. And Paul couldn't. Only Christ can. Only Christ has. Oh, so close, so simple, and yet so far away. Salvation is as simple as following the golden rule. But here's what we see in verses 13 and 14. Salvation is as difficult as doing what no one else wants to do. Verses 13 and 14 begin the conclusion of the whole sermon. So notice how there's been a transition here from the body of the sermon to basically this idea, now you've heard the truth, what are you going to do with it? What you need to do with it is enter by the narrow gate. What you need to do with it is, we'll see next time, beware the false prophets. What we'll see uh, a couple of weeks from now, what you need to do is build your house on the rock, not on the sand. This is the application. You should feel quite like those original hearers at this point. Oh, that all sounds so wonderful. Loving each other and giving to the poor and never worrying. But the thought you ought to immediately have regarding yourself is, but I fail so miserably. Friends, the fact of the matter is, even in our salvation, we've probably violated 90% of the sermon this morning before we came to church. And I don't say that pridefully or in a nonchalant, you know, so often we, we kid about that. And like, oh, I'm a sinner. Friends, that, it's despicable. Only by the grace of God, only by God's grace do we have salvation. I fail so miserable. And precisely that is the point. What you can't do, Jesus has already done. So despite my speaking of how hard it is, the good news is it's already accomplished. The price has already been paid. The righteousness has already been secured. That is very good news and it's free. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't steal it. You can't win it. You can only receive it. Simple, right? It is. But also it's not. Because the price of salvation is free, but it costs everything. It's free, but it's not cheap. Notice again verses 13 and 14 as we look at the actual passage of Scripture. Here we're at the fork in the road, if you will. So get this picture in your mind, literally kind of paint the picture in your mind's eye. Come to this fork in the road and there's one big road, a wide road. And there are many people walking down this road. I think about maybe something uh, akin to the midway at the state fair, right? Games and bells and whistles and stuffed animals and 
corn dogs and funnel cakes. And, I mean, this is the thoroughfare to be on. It's wide and it's bustling. You'll never be alone on this road. People are pressing. People are happy. It's not, a, it's not kind of a doldrum, you know, solemn funeral possession. I mean, the people on this road are living it up. It's an exciting road. Or maybe you think about it more in terms of an actual highway. But this is a highway that's broad, has plenty of space, and, and the sides, the median of the road is, is just lined with, with convenience stores and rest stops and attractions. And you look at the other road that you've come to this fork and the gate is so narrow the road is so narrow and so straight it's so small and nobody's really even on the road I mean it's so small it's such a narrow straight road that I mean it actually is gonna take some effort you're gonna have to actually kinda contort your body to get into the gate I mean, it's that narrow. You ever been to those caverns where, you know, you're going to go in and, and walk through the caverns and there's a sign there and it's got this little weird shape and it says, if you can't fit through here, don't go on this tour. That's all I needed to hear. I don't need to even try to see if I can fit in. I'm not going on the tour. That's all. That's all I needed to know. And I kind of envision this gate as that, you know. It's, it's just like, you just look at it and you're thinking, why would I even try to go down this gate or down this road? It's so narrow. And it's lonely looking. People are carrying their Bibles. They're, they're kind of Bible thumpers. Religious fanatics on this road maybe. Weird people. It looks hard. Not only is it so small that you have to kind of contort, but everything that you have with you, you have to leave behind. And can you imagine a, 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 an opening being so narrow that you have to leave your cell phone outside? Well, that just made the decision for most of you right there, right? That's not going to happen. You have to leave behind everything that you've prized. You've got to leave behind success by the world standard. You've got to leave behind relationships that are not God honoring. You've got to leave behind the crowd itself and all the fun that they seem to be having. And on top of all of that, there's nothing really particularly attractive about the narrow road. At least nothing that fallen, sinful human eyes can discern. But when you have eyes to see, you'll see that Jesus is already on that road. And you'll see the destination is one of life and joy eternally. Oh, the narrow road may not pass through Vanity Fair, but it goes to the celestial city. And friends, those on that broad road who very much enjoy their stay in Vanity Fair are on their way to destruction. There is a way that seems right unto man, but in the end it is the way of destruction. This, I, I just think John Bunyan had to be thinking about these verses as he writes Pilgrim's Progress. Has, I mean, this is Pilgrim is leaving the city of destruction. I mean, death and destruction is about to rain down on his home, and he knows it. And he follows a very difficult path. 
to the celestial city. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk a lot more about why Jesus describes this life of salvation as hard. But here's the good news. It is never so hard as to be unbearable. It is never so lonely that he is not with us by the presence of his word and his spirit. Let me just share with you one final thought on this. There's just one more thing that I want to point out because some of you may be asking yourself, how is it that we have to find the narrow gate and how do we enter the narrow gate? Because we believe that salvation is a gift, right? We believe that salvation is something that is granted to us. It's free. It's by God's grace. What is all this talk about? Strive and work hard and enter. Be careful that you don't go down the wrong path. It's all about choice, right? So in essence, Jesus is saying to you, and I'm saying to you this morning, follow the narrow road. Wait a minute, I thought we loved Jesus because he first loved us. How is it that we are to be the ones responsible for following the narrow road? Well, let me share about that. Because here's the wonderful truth of Scripture, and this applies to all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. From your perspective, from the human being's perspective, you are finding the narrow road. You're following the narrow road. In other words, you're putting your faith in Christ. You're leaning on Him. You're trusting in Him. You're repenting of your sins. You're seeing your sins for the wickedness that they are. And you're desiring to turn from those sins and embrace Christ. That is what we ought to do in the gospel proclamation in this place and around the world. If I had a megaphone loud enough, I would call out, Come to Christ! Repent of your sin and live! From a human perspective, they're coming to Christ. It's normal. It's logical. But from God's perspective... As we come to understand, as we're given the eyes to see, He alone is responsible for your finding the narrow road way. You remember when I said, it's only when you have those eyes to see that you see not only is it narrow, but Jesus is on that road. You can't see that with worldly, fleshly eyes. As Paul says in Corinthians, the natural man cannot discern spiritual things. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So here's the point. No one, and this is Jesus' whole point in the illustration, no one would in and of themselves choose to follow the narrow road. You, you, would, be, you would be labeled insane to follow the narrow road. It does not make sense from a human perspective to follow the narrow road. And friends, it's the same in reality. It does not make sense to the world to follow Christ. Because they are dead in their sin and their trespasses and they are slaves to sin and death and Satan. You would have no desire to follow it if God had not granted you the gift of following the narrow road by His grace. You would have no desire to put your faith in Jesus Christ had God not granted you that desire. You would have no ability to repent of your sins if God had not brought you from death to life. And let me explain this biblically. Let me give you a closing biblical illustration. If you will turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Now, we had a series on Josiah not long ago, and we talked about how Josiah found the book of the law, and he reinstated the Passover. And I mentioned just in passing in one of those sermons that Hezekiah had done the same thing in a limited way some years before Josiah's reign. 
This is the story of when, Joseph, when Hezekiah institutes the Passover. I want to try to give you this as an illustration for what happens in salvation. Okay? So let me set the stage before I read it. So I say to you, okay, let's, let's pretend like I'm sharing the gospel with you and you're a lost person. And I say to you, repent and believe in Jesus. And you say, I want to repent and believe in Jesus. Now from that exchange, it looks like you're totally responsible for what has just happened. But what I believe Scripture teaches very clearly is God has authored and been the architect behind that whole exchange. Let me explain why I think that is the case biblically. Look at chapter 30 of 2 Chronicles. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. For the king and his princes and all the assembly in Jerusalem had taken counsel to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at, the time, at that time because the priests had not consecrated themselves in sufficient number nor had the people assembled in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And the plan seemed right to the king and the assembly. So notice what happens. They've all agreed it's a good thing to reinstate and celebrate the Passover. And here's the dilemma. We got to get the word to the people and convince them it's the right thing for them to do. Okay? We got to send them letters saying observe the Passover. So that's where we pick up. So, verse 5, they decreed to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan that the people should come up and keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel, at Jerusalem, for they had not kept it as often as prescribed. So they've recognized they've sinned by not keeping the Passover, and now they're calling for the people to come to Jerusalem and observe the Passover. So couriers went throughout all of Israel and Judah with letters from the king and his princes as the king had commanded, saying, here's what the letter says, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may turn again to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your fathers and your brothers who were faithless to the Lord God and their fathers, so that he made them a desolation as you see. It corresponds perfectly to what's going to happen later in the Babylonian captivity in the very place that Ken read a moment ago in Daniel chapter 9. It's what's happening. They're coming out of that captivity. This is before that captivity. He says, do not now be stiff-necked as your fathers were. Do not resist. Don't be hard-hearted. Come to Jesus, he's saying. Except in this case, come to the Passover. He says, he goes on, but yield yourselves to the Lord. And come to his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever, and serve the Lord your God, that his fierce anger may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. Pause right there. What does that sound like? That is a very clear commandment for the people to turn. God is waiting on them to repent, right? God is there. He's saying, if you'll turn to me, I'll turn to you. And the letter says to people, please don't be like your fathers. Please repent. Don't be hard-hearted. Listen to what God is saying. He's pleading with the people. He's pleading as a prophet would call out to a sinful people, as a preacher would call out to a lost person, as you would plead with your brother or your sister or your mother or your father, and you would say, don't die, come to Christ and live. That's what he's doing, he's pleading with them. So by that point, it looks like it's all on you. What are you going to do? Salvation lies in your hand. You will accept it or you will reject it. It's what it looks like, very clearly. Verse 10. So the couriers went from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun 
but they laugh them to scorn and mock them. They're committing the same sin as their fathers. They're rejecting in hard-heartedness the message to repent. Now listen, verse 11 and 12, and we're done. However, some of the men of Asher, of Manasseh, and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Still kind of sounds like they, they were smart enough, right? They were wise enough, they got the picture. Why are some people saved and other people not saved? Well, it's obvious because some people are more spiritual, some people are wiser, some people aren't as ignorant of what the Bible says. No. Oh, it sounds like it to this point, but look at the last verse, verse 12. The hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. Do you understand what's happening there? The only way the people had the ability to repent and observe the Passover was that by God's grace, He granted him the gift to observe the Passover. So when we say, put your faith in Jesus, follow the narrow road, you have to say, as we've mentioned Augustine a couple of times who said this, Lord... Command what you will, but give what you command. In other words, Lord, my desire is to follow the narrow road. And I know that I wouldn't even have that desire apart from your perfect love and grace. And so you and you alone, by the power of your Holy Spirit, must enable me to follow the narrow road. Because apart from His power, you will be on the broad road to destruction. And guess what? In all of it, he gets all of the glory and all of the honor. I get none. He alone is worthy of praise and adoration. God has commanded each of us to follow the narrow way of salvation in Christ. But the only way you can do that is by his gracious gift of faith and repentance. So my question is very simple this morning as will be the application of these passages in the next couple of weeks.